start with Tamara and uh, just again, welcome Tamara. And if we could have our other members go on mute uh, and uh, we will have to have different questions uh, from our different interviewers. We have our format is that we have five minutes each. And so uh, Tamara, um, the first question I have, first of all, is how is this for you in terms of now that you've had this whole term almost under your belt, how has this whole transition been for you with your lifestyle, with your focus, uh, and certainly the transition of being more out there working with our oceans, now more indoors working on county council issues. How is that for you personally? Well, aloha, awina la e ko Maui, maina pili. Thank you so much for this opportunity and um, thank you all for all the hard work that you're doing. I didn't realize how long that you've been doing this and, and how much effort and work that you've um, put into it. And, um, you know, when I first start, started looking at um, who I would vote for, we didn't have options, you know, it was all just a one candidate race. So thank you so much for all your hard work, first of all. Um, as far as um, getting the first term under my belt, you know, it, it was a, a kind of a culture shock at first. I, I'm reminded um, from some of my staff, like one of the biggest challenges was um, the windows in uh, my office didn't open, <laughs> you know, and, and it's like you can see the wind, but you can't feel it. Um, but, um, you know, there, there's change and adjustment in everything. And, um, you know, I, I, I can see the similarities in working on the county council to working at the beach in that, you know, you can do all your homework and prepare everything. Like you can come to work with your, um, you know, all your dive gear or your surfboard and, Mother Nature throws you a curveball, you know? You got all your surfboards and it's flat. Or you got your dive gear and it's choppy and murky. And I think that's a lot like um, being on the council, you know? Um, Pre-COVID, I was focusing so much effort and um, homework and work on over-tourism, <laughs> you know? Like, how are we going to control all this tourism and these short-term rentals and all of these things? And it's like, well, not that that was a waste of time, but um, it's it's no longer a pressing priority, you know, now that we have so many unemployed and things like that, that takes more of a precedent. So, um, you know, in, in the dealing with and um, working with nine different council members, working with a mayor, and you kind of got to stay in your own lane as, as to, you know, some people are... Um, possessive of their district like don't touch my district or you know the administration is like this is my role and so it, it is um I think similar sorry Wendy <laughs> similar to um working in the beach although I, I didn't um see the similarities at first I just missed the outdoors and the beach um but I, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting a hang of it. Um, and, and, you know, just when you get a hang of it, you get another curveball with, okay, stay at home every day, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm adapting pretty well. Great. Thank you for that response, Tamara. I, I guess just along that line, you know, you mentioned about our tourism and how you were preparing because we were getting to that place of overcrowd. We were, I guess, the county council plan said 33% uh, carrying capacity, and we probably got up to somewhere around 42% or so. Yeah. Uh, now, now, how uh, in this post-pandemic realm, how are we looking at tourism? Are we going to have it so that it is more controlled in some way, shape, or form so that we can go back gradually and maybe not to the capacity that we had at one point in time? Where are you personally in the county council along this issue? Well, you know, I, I, I fought real hard to try and defund the um, Maui Visitors Bureau both, both years. Um, and since then, uh, 
I've, I've watched this uh, TED Talks, and I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the exact name of the speaker, but the points that he was making was, were, like, making so much sense, you know, like, hotels, rental cars, airlines, the more people that they, the more seats they fill, the more return that they get, you know, but the destination itself, the more people that were coming here, the less um, daily spending we were getting, the less, um, regardless of how much TAT tax we generated, we were getting a, not as much back because there was a cap on the amount that the state gives back to the county. So while all of these industries that need to fill up their seats wanted more, build more hotels, bring in more rental cars, bring in more flights, and they were making more and more and more, the destination itself was suffering. You know, the, the dollar spending per day per visitor was going down. The quality of life for our residents was going down. And the thing that he said to me that really um, struck a nerve was you can't have the people that are in charge of marketing tourism also be in charge of managing tourism, you know, and that's kind of what we had been trying to do in, in telling the visitors bureau, you need to educate the tourists. You need to do this. You need to do that. That's not really in their interest to tell somebody you can come, but you got to respect the people and the water and all that. So, you know, it, it really um, opened my eyes that we need to, um, keep those in their own separate lanes. You know, we can't have marketing in charge of managing and we need to be the managers. We can't have outside entities telling us how it's going to be. We need to be the ones telling them this is how it's going to be. And, you know, I, um, I did have an interview with the Hawaii Labor Coalition and they, they asked me about over-tourism. And as I was thinking about it, it's not strictly about the numbers. You know, it's, it's also about like, Say we have 100,000 people a day on Maui and they're here because they love our culture, they love our environment, they love the authenticity and they want to come into the valley and they want to clean the lo'i or they want to clean the awai. Is that over tourism? If they're coming over here to help us clean up our area and learn, you know, how we plant kalo, to learn how we um, mm. make pa'i'ai and things like that, you know, what... What is over tourism is when we have the multitudes coming and they're doing what they want to do at our expense or at our environment's expense. So I think, you know, those are things I don't I don't have all the answers. And um, I just think it's a real shift in the way we think of it. It doesn't have to be uh, like it ha uh, exclusive. I'm, I'm not for exclusive, like only the richest people can come here and they can sit on the beach and you know, use their special sunscreen, like, we can have a lot of people here, but you got to get with our program, you know, not with what, what you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and, you know, if we have mentors come here, we, we need to diversify our economy. So, you know, if we have world-class teachers come here and teach us how to teach world-class um, healthcare profession professionals, we just were in the healthy families and communities and they were talking about how they used to have to import these traveling nurses, you know, like why would we import traveling nurses, you know? And so, um, and I, I shared my story about like, we really need more orthopedic surgeons here, you know? So um, maybe the best of the world can come here on vacation and, and do like a work exchange where they, they teach our people some classes, you know? So I think that the only limitation is, is our own mind and, and, you know, I think the sky's the limit, but we just need more people to, to not be so close-minded about things and, and not be so scared. I think um, a lot of times fear of the unknown will um, limit, limit our possibilities. Well, well, Tamara, thank you for that. And uh, certainly what you've just described and looked at really is expanding our awareness and consciousness of possibilities and how we can make this really be a paradise and how this shift can be a real positive upswing for our community. And, uh, and, and this I is the type so. of creative thinking that, that I think uh, is, I find very exciting. Uh, Sylvia, you want to take the next question and then Daniel? Aloha, Tamara. Thank you so much for coming. Aloha. Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, a long 
along, along those lines, um, diversifying our economy, um, high on the list would be agriculture. Uh, how can we promote uh, small organic farms and um, how can we make farmland more accessible to people on Maui? Well, um, so I might not have mentioned it, but I'm the chair of the Planning and Sustainable Land Use Committee, and I also was on the um, Budget Committee Temporary Investigative Group. And I feel like that was a really good um, blend of, of areas to look at because, you know, you have planning and land use, and then when you, um, it was a property tax temporary investigative group, so you look at um, the tax classifications, and um, I think... Uh, our budget chair is thinking of doing a TIG too because we, we didn't finish all that we wanted to accomplish, but we had to break it up into pieces for us to be able to implement certain things right away. But, um, you know, I would like to see, and I'm not sure that two years or even 10 years is enough time to do it if I'm working on my own, but if there's outside groups helping out and, and doing parts of it possibly, but I think that, you know, if we look at all of our land that's designated ag, whether it's the state designation, the county zoning or whatever, and then we look at how much of it is fallow, you know, it, it's just the fallow fields, especially around Lahaina, that is a fire hazard, you know, I mean, everywhere, even on the Central Valley and whatnot. And, and possibly, you know, we, we make incentive programs if, if, and, and, penalties if you're gonna just leave your land fallow and it's turning into this fire hazard or whatever then you know you maybe your property tax is gonna go up a ha uh, ag hazard tax pro property tax or something you know I, I don't know exactly but I think it is crazy because we do have a lot of ag land that's fallow and we do have a lot of need to create our own whether it be food or fuel or whatever it is. And, you know, some of, um, because of the history of, of Hawaii and whatnot, um, the state zoning is in three or four very broad categories. And a lot of folks like to say that not all ag land is good ag land because it's rocky soil or whatever the case may be. But, you know, we got solar, you can do solar on the ag land and, and if, the way of the future, you know, we're going to, they're probably going to want wide swaths of land for solar or, um, you know, my, my, um, mother lives on the big Island and she, um, is, a a practitioner of the Korean natural farming, you know? And, and so like, maybe not everybody is so good at creating their own lactic acid bacteria or there, there's not a lot of people that, do the fishing and farming where they make their own fish amino acids. So maybe it's not even the farming, but it's the area, you know, to make your own um, inputs and things like that. I, I would love to see us stop importing any kind of um, chemical petroleum based fertilizers. You know, I mean, um, in council member Ricky Hokama's committee there, they had a thing about feral animals and it mostly was a conversation between cats and birds but feral chickens is a big issue for a lot of people you know and 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 it's it's not a positive thing to them but if you just shift it like we were talking about feral chickens could be the solution to so many issues you know like um food scraps slop feed it to the chickens um you know some people don't like fertilized eggs but to me they taste the same as unfertilized eggs i, I don't know the big um need to have lay hens because before when my husband was working we ha we just caught a bunch of feral chickens and fed them chicken feed and ate their eggs and it tasted the same to me so i mean you know you have maybe a food source for homeless you get all the eggs you collect the chicken manure that's like quality stuff there you know and and so i mean just and then you know maybe you have some some people that don't have jobs at the moment tend to that and and that's um you know just a a contributor you know so instead of having people stuck at home all day worrying about when their unemployment is kicking in you got you got to go tend your chickens and stuff like that so i mean 
that's kind of yeah. um, my my thoughts on agriculture. I'm not a very good farmer. My my husband is the one that waters all our plants, and um, I just I'm like the cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your perspective on that. You know, my neighbor is a small organic farmer, and I asked him yesterday, like, what's the holdup? Why can't we grow all our own food? And he said it's the cost of the land is so prohibitive that you can't make a profit. He says that there's so many young people just chomping at the bit to get in and grow food here and they don't have the access to the land. He himself said that he built a rental house on his farmland to subsidize his farm because his dream was to be a farmer. Um, yeah. So how can we subsidize farming? And is um, a Department of Agriculture part of the solution to that? Or, and what is the function of that? Well, um, I, I would like to look into like tax incentives and penalties for fallow lands. You know, I mean, there's no reason for um, ag land to sit fallow. A uh, little bit of the, the issue that I can see beyond the land is the water. I mean, especially here in Lahaina, water is for fighting, you know. Um, but um, yeah, I think the the Department of Agriculture is, is a pretty good idea. Um, they would have to Probably, I mean, we have a state department of agriculture, but to me, they're nowhere near sufficient um, in in their responsibilities. I mean, just look at how much money we have to put aside every budget um, year for invasive species. And, and now we're talking about murder hornets and things like that coming in. Like, we don't have enough, um, we don't have enough controls over our own borders i mean if if they did we wouldn't have all those illegal fireworks you know so i mean there's there's practically zero control and and we we do need to i mean maybe the department of agriculture could take a look and say where is their good farming that land is available water is available housing is available and if you're there leaving it fallow or you're charging exorbitant prices for other people to farm it taxes go up, you know, because it's, it's not about, yeah. about, it's about survival almost at this point with the young brother situation and, you know, climate change. And it's like, we got to start thinking not smarter, but, you know, common sense, realistic. Like a lot of the things that are holding us back is just paper, paper currency that you can't eat it. You, it doesn't make real sense, you know? It's um, somebody else's laws that they came and put on this island. That's yeah, yeah. Boxing. Thank you, thank you for that answer. I'll pass you on to the next questioner. Aloha, Tamara. So, Aloha. I'm, I'm so glad you can make it. Um, I, I thanks for inviting me. I don't know if you have uh, caught some of the other episodes that we've been doing, but I have to say that. Uh, this one question that I've been passing around has been um, utmostly inspired by by you and um, and, and, and what you actually did um, with bringing in Keanu Sai into the county oh. council to give those presentations. Um, like I had I had spent some time up on Mount Kea and and so had gotten to meet uh, Keanu Sai and um, attend some events that he has. Uh, done since then here on the Big Island, and he had told me that Maui County was the only uh, was the only office that he was able to get into. He's he's approached the others and was actually denied. So, um, so I'm real curious to to know more about that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the same question I've been asking all the other candidates. And I'll start with this question, and we can have a conversation about it. So as a public representative, it is a duty to face the truth and to act righteously. These islands reflect the lowest voter turnout in the United States. On May 15th, 2019, Dr. David Keanu Sai gave a presentation to the Maui County Council, evidencing the illegal overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani in 1893 and showing clear violation of domestic and international law with the ongoing illegal United States military occupation of the Kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands. As a candidate for public representation, how do you rectify handling the truth of Dr. Sai's presentation 
as well as the works of the Kohavai Paiaina Office in Hilo, Keamoku Kapu, Henry Noah, Amelia Gora, Bumpikanahele, Leon Su, Dr. Desaius, Madame Ruth Bolome, etc. How do you rectify the compliance of the law and restoration of occupied lands? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, so much to say, <laughs> so little time. Um, you know, you start rectifying it by raising education and awareness. Um, as I came into office, um, Jennifer Ruggles was just leaving office, you know, and, and um, I had prior to taking the oath, I, I was nervous about taking the oath as well. And I, I had a good friend and, and mentor that was like, hey, I know somebody. And, and she introduced me to um, Dr. Sai. And we had many conversations and, and, you know, he wanted me at first to, um, you know, kind of follow in Jennifer Ruggles' footsteps. And I was like, well, I, I'm not sure about that, you know, because I felt bad for other people that um, got me to the point where we're just taking office. And, and we were thinking about it and we had many discussions and conversations and, um, one of my inner circle was like, you know, nobody's going to know why you're doing it or, or if you if you go down that path. And so we, we talked about it some more and, and we decided to have the presentation, you know, just to because nobody really knows all that history unless you um, are in college nowadays. And, and it's funny thing. I, I ran into um, one of the kid paddlers um, in our canoe club after or before and we were talking about it he was in college by that time and he's all like you know I never even knew any of that stuff I had I had to go to college to learn it and like now I'm 20 I'm like I'm 40 <laughs> it took me like be glad you learned it at 20 you know so I think you know the first step is to raise education and awareness and from there you know keep it in mind and um my background in community advocacy um, comes from the Save Honolulu Coalition, like where we got together and we decided that Honolulu was so important that we were gonna do everything that we could to save it, whether it's, you know, right to politicians, show up at hearings, show up at the state, show up at the county, go to other nonprofits, go to um, uh, businesses and whatnot and get the, the support that we needed. And it's the same thing for this um, occupation that we're in. Every single avenue that you can, every single opportunity that you can, you just um, raise awareness because that's part of the, the laws that we're boxed into. That's why we're um, facing the problems that we're facing today because we're having a continental mentality and a westernized laws being put upon us and and direct our thinking that we can't solve the problems ourselves that we're so dependent on this other system um from the time i was young you know i i i felt or knew that america and hawaii wasn't the right thing and i remember um people telling me like oh well and this is before mcdonald's was was a bad thing or whatever they're like well if you want to go back to the the kingdom then you can't ever eat at McDonald's because, you know, Hawaii never had McDonald's or only America has McDonald's. And I was like, well, I mean, McDonald's is great, but whatever. And and then one time later in life, I went to Japan and I'm like, hey, they got McDonald's. They're, they're not America. You know, it's like that kind of fear mindset of things that it's they, they tell you it can't be done, but it's only because they're not doing it. And um, one of... um. One of my, my husband's cousins told us um, something and, and I, you know, some people say, you know, if all those different uh, groups, if all Hawaiians got on the same page, then we could um, reclaim Hawaii and, and regain our sovereignty. And, and that's true. It would be so much easier if everybody like got on the same page and, and worked together towards it. But um, my husband's cousin, Kapali Keahi, he said, that's BS because where else in the world do you see any person all on the same page? America has libertarians, Republicans, Democrats, you know, every other country in the world 
has opposing viewpoints within their people and they're allowed to be a, their own country, you know? And, and I don't think it's the um, different ideas or the different avenues that we take that makes us weaker. It, it, it really makes us stronger, although it might take us a little longer to get there. You know, when, oh, my time's up. <laughs> Like so much to say, so little time. No, I, I, I definitely appreciate all of the insights, even just that last part that you had mentioned there. Um, uh, if I can just get maybe a minute longer, because uh, because I'm I'm uh, I'm curious to to hear. Let me see, one 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 more question on this because Keanu Sai was able to get in based on the invitation from yourself. Uh, was there was it was it was there a necessary other addition to that was it um was was the lead chair required to accept that or was it just because you invited that he was able to to show up like what was the what was the requirement there for him to actually get into the county and give that well maybe the things that i were was planning before we settled on the idea of having him give a presentation were what much more radical that they thought it was a good idea that I just have a presentation, <laughs> you know, like I, I forget the exact details, but I, I, I was planning on um, sending a letter, sending some letters to some different agencies and, and doing other things. And, and all of this was going on in my head when I was like, well, nobody knows all these things that are going on in my head. And it's like, rewind, start at the beginning what's going on what's the problem like why why was i even scared to take the oath of office the oath of office is to uphold the the united states constitution which says that there shall be no treat annexation without a treaty you know and so it's it's all legit stuff as as dr sai breaks it down and um as we're assigned our committees we have jurisdiction of our own committee to designate who is a resource person um, and you just put it on your agenda. I'm going to have um, Dr. Keanu Sai give a presentation about the legal status of America under, in, or un, of Hawaii under international law. So then when um, you have the person show up, whoever it is that you designate okay. as the resource person, you're, you say, I'd like to designate this person as a resource based on whatever his criteria and qualifications are. And then you ask your committee any objections and then they say no objections and um you know we different committees have had different resource people come in and and you know as long as they're a legit credentialed person i don't see a reason why they wouldn't be allowed okay good to know uh good to know for other other counties as well because i know that um you know he was he was looking to to approach the other islands as well so Mahalo, Tamara. I'm going to pass it on to the next interviewer now. Great. Um, uh, Bruce, are you uh, back yet? Uh, then, no, I will ask the next question then. Give me, uh, uh, give me a couple more minutes. You ask some questions and I'll be ready. Okay. To okay. Uh, so, uh, Tamara, my, my question has to do about our natural resources. Uh, the first one is about the lifeblood of the island. Um, and uh, for the county council, would you support the county asserting eminent domain over the EMI system in order to administer the public trust water resource for the food security necessary for our community? Would I support eminent domain of the EMI system? Correct, so uh, in terms of water access and distribution. Um, yeah, I'd support it. I think um, we, right when there was the case against EMI, the um, Shaitan Hodges, I, I believe she's the um, chair of the Board of Water Supply, and they, um, they did, a, she did a presentation. I think there was a little hoo-hoo because um, she gave us a presentation before um, the release of their TIG to their board. Um, but you know, that's just minor fine details. But um, I think that they um, did did support that. And, and, you know, she's a reader and she does her homework and she had all these details in, in the report. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that the county 
could do a better job necessarily. But I think that, you know, water and its distribution system is a public trust resource. And I don't think that it has been distributed fairly in terms of, you know, we do need water here, but the source is East Maui and we shouldn't be taking their water when uh, and leaving them with no water when we don't have the same type of agriculture going on that um, the sugar plantations and, and whatnot used to have in, in, in the past. You know, I, I mean, if the distribution system was not leaking and, and, you know, was properly maintained and administered, I think there would be enough water to share. Um, in other ways, though, you know, I think we shouldn't be leaving East Maui dry. And I, I believe excess water can be distributed to the central. But, you know, if you step back a little and look at the big picture, our um, Kahului wastewater treatment facility is right there, like by Nazca and like that. And with the break wall around it, uh, any kind of tsunami or sea level rise and situation, is it's not a great situation. And as we're moving away from injection wells, um, you know, it makes sense to transition away from taking other districts' water, too. Like, if we're going to um, slowly build another plant somewhere inland, whether it's Waikapu or um, somewhere else in the Central Valley, and, and then set up the system for distribution of that R1 water, or... Um, you know, just just look at a lot of different ways to diversify our water resources and not hoard it. The worst thing is water hoarding to me and, and wasting water. So what I hear, uh, Tamara, is that we have an opportunity, certainly with the plantations shutting down and the needs that we have right now. I guess there's a big question about who owns the water. Who owns the water distribution? Is it a foreign Canadian company that uh, we give that over to? Because it mm. certainly does to have a huge impact on the types of crops we grow, where we can grow the crops, and also our any type of uh, you know construction that we have and developments. So, so if if you're talking about um, like Mahi Pono and them owning the water distribution and whatnot, to me, um, I would. I envision it more like a, a public-private partnership where they can invest in the system, but they should not be controlling it. You know, it, it, mm. it would have to be like a public trust. Like, yeah, we'll take your money because you need some water and we'll fix up the system, but you're not the one controlling it because water is a public trust and ev everybody knows that at least here, water is a public trust. So, you know, you need the water. And, and as does the rest of the Central Valley and some of upcountry. So, you know, yeah, you'll need to pay in to fix the system so it's not leaking and whatnot, and we don't have to take all the water from East Maui. But that doesn't mean you control it. You know, it, it has to be distributed right. fairly. Th thank you for that, Tamara. And, th and that's uh, a very interesting approach, too. Uh, along the same line, in terms of our uh, different resources that we have, uh, since uh, it has to do with electricity, uh, and since Maui residents pay the highest electric rates in the nation based on electric being provided by a private corporation, Miko, and Kauai pays the lowest rates in the nation based on electric being provided by a community cooperative, what are your thoughts about supporting efforts to changing our electric distribution system from a private cooperative to, to a publicly owned and operated system or cooperative? Um, you know, at, at the county level, I haven't given too much thought of the overall big picture of electric electricity distribution in um, 
Shane Sinensi's committee the other day, Dr. Um, Beamer spoke to us a little bit about um, things that they do in uh, the European Union and Germany where they have simple policies that um, are, I guess, legislation where they require the electric companies to purchase or use any any um, electricity that's generated by, you know, small um, energy producers, I guess. And and it was part of his talk about a circular economy. Um, I don't feel like I'm, I'm that qualified to speak on electricity as a whole. I, I support a decentralized grid, um, you know, because I think that, you know, self-sufficiency in your own areas is important. But I, I don't feel really qualified um, to, to speak to that type of situation. I know um, that, you know, Kauai does have an independent utility company and, and you know, it's, it, there, there might be some fear associated with that. You know, you have to have a good trust in who is running whoever it is running it and and you want it to be local but what if they don't choose the right choices so it helps that they're living here because you know then they're in the same boat as you but i i don't feel super qualified on on that um right stance well, well thank you and, and you know and, and there's a lot of things that are developing and evolving uh, certainly with microgrids uh, lessening the use of transmission lines like are happening in California with all the fires. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in that realm. And, and what I hear is that you're wide open to explore those different avenues. Oh, yeah. Um, Even um, the fire department doesn't want to conclusively point to a lot of the um, really bad fires we've had that have shut down the Pali the one above Ma'alaya. I mean, there's no way that could have been started by anything else to me, but officially can't say anything. But it started way up in the mountain, right under a power line. So, you know, diversification, um, localized grids, all of that, I'm, I'm in support of it just because I, although there is no proof and we can't make any claims, I do think a lot of our, our fires are started by um, electric lines. Great. Thank you for that. And Bruce, uh, if you can unmute and you're next. Thank you very much. Hi, Tam. Tamara. Hello. I am, I'm really happy to see our county manager system being going before a vote of the county council. Do you feel that had all the components in it that you would have liked to have seen or there's some components that you would have changed or preferred? You know, um, I followed the county manager idea for a long time. It was one of my um, platform points when I ran for mayor in 2014. And I um, was able to then sit on the um, special commission on governance. Um, I think that was in 2016. And, uh, you know, it, I think that every iteration that we go as, as we've gone along from my basicest of understanding back in 2014 to all the research that we did in 2016 to the um, critiquing that we've had in 2018 and 2019. I, I do believe every iteration does get better. Um, the interesting thing is that as the county manager situation is being fine tuned, there were other factors in play like um, us now, as the council now being able to um, approve or disapprove all of the directors, and that kind of threw another spin into it. Like when we first were talking about the county manager, it was because some of the people that were being chosen as directors really had no um, business being directors, and it it's gotten a little bit better. And, and I still do feel that we, we need a county manager position. I, to me, you know, you can have a, a bad county manager or you can have a, a bad managing director or you could have a good managing director or a good uh, county manager. And it, it comes down to the people, you know, in, in the position. The, 
the thing that really draws me to the county manager position as a former county worker that worked through the R. I, I got hired under uh, Mayor Apana. So I started under Apana. I worked under Arakawa, and then I worked under Tavares, and then I worked under Arakawa, and then Arakawa again. And so that kind of um, back and forth, changing the managing director every four years, changing out all the directors every four years, that was a huge waste to me. And, and I think that's one of the most important components of what we have now is that it's not tied to a political cycle. And if we can ensure that it's tied to a, um, like some sort of merit cycle and, and where, you know, people see that the directors are making good progress, they're getting things done, or they're not. You know, and that's what will determine whether you stay or whether you go. I, I know a lot of people were against the managing director idea when I was on the commission, and they still are because of some idea of golden parachutes. They call um, the athletic coaches of UH, you know, once they got rid of them, their contracts said we pay them a big amount of money. But I think that, you know, Maui, we have so much going for us as a as a desirable place to live that we can attract good talent we can um grow our own good talent and if people realize that you know you work hard you get good results you persevere you, you do all these things you can grow into becoming the managing director and and you don't have to go and wave signs on the side of the highway just to get your position you know i think that's that's one of the most important points and i think you know Possibly, we didn't get it perfect. I'm not sure because we haven't tried it yet, but I think we're at, at the best stage that could be right now. And, and if it's totally horrible, we can always go back and tweak it. I would imagine, you know, that laws, you make, you make policy, you make laws, you, it doesn't work. You go back and change what doesn't work. You keep what, right. what does work. Fantastic. What are your feelings um, about district voting? And if you like district voting, do you would you rather see the nine equal size districts, or would you rather see the three senatorial districts with three members each? Hmm. Well, you know, personally, like as a voter, I like to vote for all the nine people. But as a candidate, I don't like having to go to all the nine districts. So I'm, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other in that regard. Um, the one person, one vote, I think it would be harsh on uh, Lanai, Molokai, and Hana compared to what they have now. So I can see them not wanting to give it up. Um, I did, Lance, I... I used to speak about this with um, Lance Collins. I don't know if you know who he is. He um, oh, yeah. done a lot of good work in West Maui. Um, and one of his ideas was um, the six major districts on Maui, like Lahaina, Kihe, um, Upcountry, uh, Kahului, Wailuku, would, would kind of stay the same and have their districts. And... Um, Hana, Molokai, and Lanai would have their residency. Well, they'd all have their residency requirements, but Hana, Molokai, and Lanai would be at large voting. So they would still have to travel everywhere and get everyone's um, buy in, but they would have their own representative living in Hana. And I thought that was an interesting idea. Um, I'm not tied to any one model, I'm, I'm open for whatever gets to the charter you know i don't i don't have a strong opinion on it um i guess because i like to vote for all but i don't like to campaign all over the place so it's uh, well it has created a problem for new campaign you have to have a lot of money to campaign the whole island so it starts to make it financially exclusionary to those who have big funding yeah yeah but the yeah. three senatorial districts and there'd be three members from each and say 
Hana would be one of those districts, you know, and there could be a seat from Hana. So it could be the same sort of thing, but have it as smaller districts. So there's so that like system. Raj, that or there's, you got Roz, you got Gilkeith, There are three senatorial Iran, districts, and, um, which is already divided by English. the state. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so we use those because they're already divided by the state, but each one of those would have three members and each would have a seat for each thing. So the, the East Maui end, one would be Hana, one would be Haiku, another one Kula, like that. You know, so you'd have the seats within it, but they would be equal sizes for voting. So just thought I'd how throw would, that out. How would that work for um, our senator is uh, currently Roz Baker, and she represents South and West Maui. So if you have three, how do you decide if one person has to live in South Maui, one person has to live in West Maui, where does a third person live? I don't have all those details, but they would have the, like, Molokai and I would each have one representative within that system. So we would still have seats, three seats within the system, because they wouldn't have to be equal size, you know, as long as that whole district voted on them. And that was a way around it. Anyway, we'll go over that later. <laughs> uh, another question is... Uh, how do you feel about term limits, uh, making the charter minimum for term limits, to take the word consecutive out of the wording so you have four, each person is limited to four terms, end of story. Yeah, I tried to um, propose that amendment onto uh, member commas charter amendment, but I guess um, because of the title, um, it would have made it not jive, so I wasn't allowed to, but I'm, yeah, I'm for it. I don't, who wants to stay around longer? <laughs> 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 oh, uh, okay, with that, I'll pass it to the next person. Okay, Sylvia, I think you're next, and then Daniel after that. Yeah, um, so thanks, Tamara. And what is at the top of your agenda going into this next term? What are the priorities that you're looking at pursuing? Um, well, so I, I'd, I'd like to um, continue on as the um, Planning and sus Sustainable Land Use Chair. Um, you know, a big priority for me is our community plans. Um, we just finished the community plan for West Maui at the Community Plan Advisory Committee level, and now it's going on to the Planning Commission, and it's then it's going um, to come before us as the County Council. So, you know, I'm, I, I really um, love the community plan process. I, I almost wish that we would have gone to the community plans first and then worked backwards to the Maui Island plan and the general plan that way so that it could be more of a like kind of a grassroots up kind of thing but um bygones we're, we're here at the community plans now and and so I'm, I'm stoked on it um you know I wish we could have had all of them going simultaneously but I can understand that the planning department doesn't have that kind of staff and, and we don't have the kind of money to do all of it at once um so community plans definitely uh a priority for me. Um, we're just opening up our um, West Maui district office. That took uh, this whole time pretty much to, to get started. And, you know, in our chairs meeting um, and member Kama and member Keon, uh, Keani Rollins Fernandez, we're talking about, you know, each district having their own um, office so that instead of us all going to the central building, that we're more out in our community. And, and I'm, I'm always um, a proponent of decentralization because I think that we have more um, authentic input from our respective communities that way. Um, Member Molina and Member King are really pushing uh, community advisories at the community level to the planning commission and um you know i'm i'm not opposed to that idea um the thing that i'm opposed to in the current form and i hope that we can get in that direction is um in the early discussions it's um they want them to be advisory to the planning commission and with our current economic um outlook it 
seems like it could cost a lot to get that up and running. And so to me, I'd like them to have actual decision-making authority, you know, instead of just having a community group that's going to give the planning commission advice, which they can take or leave, like how the planning commission gives us advice, which we can take or leave, let them actually make the decisions that the planning commission makes within their own communities. You know, the main um, responsibility of the planning commissions are uh, mostly SMA. I mean, they have a lot of responsibility, but the ones that are crucial to me and I think a lot of communities, especially during this time of sea level rise, is um, within the special management area, which is, you know, the the um, sea level rise exposure area and, and like the, the near shore um, portions of the islands. And so I, I kind of want to take it to that next step where they have the authority within their communities to make those decisions. And, and the, I think the planning department at the advisory level, they were kind of like, I don't know, this sounds like more work. But then when you just shift it to like, okay, they're going to actually be making the decisions. And they're like, oh, that could work. You know, they, it seemed like they bought into it more. And to me, it just makes sense. You know, if you're going to meet and you're going to do all this and you're going to have a decision, make that be the decision. Why are you going to have somebody in central Maui then say like, well, they thought that, but I'm going to just whatever, you know? So I, I, I'd like to kind of try and steer the direction in that or steer the conversation in that direction, um, if possible, if, if the folks are still interested in it. Um, yeah. Um, does that include the, the planning? Um, does that include the Wailuku uh, hotel that's being proposed? Um, do you have kind of a vision for what the community plan for Wailuku should be? What are your views on, on that um, proposed development? So um, that's kind of a whole nother beast. It's, it's, they have this um, special area called the Wailuku Redevelopment Area and the Maui Redevelopment Agency. And I think um, Lance was also looking into the legality of that um, as council members and as the Planning and Land Use Chair, you know, it, it's within my committee's uh, jurisdiction to decide on zoning and things like that. And yet we have like this five member appointed board that has like zero transparency. There's no Akaku. They meet in the middle of the day in this very tiny room and they're making these decisions and then people hear about it and they're like, whoa, what? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I, I I do question a little bit the legality of that and, and they have um you know um one of one of my staff is looking into the hotel Wailuku and, and we're we're preparing comments for um the June eighth deadline of the draft environmental assessment. But um you know I I don't wanna speak negatively about anybody, but it it just doesn't feel right that the developer of this hotel was on this kind of like appointed little redevelopment agency and and you know like in hindsight you can see the stage was being set for this next thing to happen and 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 you know there is a lot of community outcry against it. I think the urban design and review board there were 71 people or so on the um, blue jeans meeting and majority of them save like about two spoke out against it and and to plow ahead with this idea especially when we're saying diversify and it was over tourism it's just um it's kind of disheartening coming from a place where we're doing our community plans I wouldn't I wouldn't call the Maui Redevelopment Agency a community organization. You know, it's, it's even, even our community plan advisory committees are filmed on Akaku and that these, um, this agency, a five member board appointed 
has so much say that they can change zoning, you know? And and that's something that I got however many votes to be able to do. And and my testimony when when they were hearing about like making it be allowed to be a six story hotel, I was like you're going to do this in, in this dark little room and we're going to get blamed because it's my authority to change zoning, you know? And I'm going to be all like, it wasn't me. <laughs> so, thank, thank, not thank you. for it. <laughs> thank you for that insight on, on tomorrow, especially how the system works. And I think that's why we're looking at getting progressive candidates so that we can look at systemic change. Uh, and Tom, Tommy, uh, I see that you're on, and uh, would you like to ask a question of Tamara? Hi, Tamara. How are you? Oh, hey, Tommy. How's it going? Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Sure thing. You were on the meeting this morning, too, huh? I was. I was. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, – hopefully you can um, – help out some of those grantees and whatnot. But you know, you kept bringing up Wailuku uh, Main Street Association. Sorry. And Sorry. No, no, that was great because we're the ones who broke the story about her. Oh. Um, and that was after I was involved with Line Town Action Committee in the 90s. And that's when I first heard of like, why does she get all this budget every year? when She doesn't even do any of the, any of the events. Like, how does this even make any sense? So it took like yeah. another 15 years or something for you know, it to come through. So my big question for you is, um, you know, West Maui, well, let's see, Maui County is, you know, one of the hardest hit counties in the nation over COVID. And, you know, our economic driving engines would, you know, West Maui and South Maui, West Maui still is the majority and the crown jewel of our, of the economic driver. And if the representative from West Maui is, um, you know, really open to, you know, a new type of Hawaii, a new type of visitor industry. Uh, this is the opportunity for change. What the, what does that say to the business community in West Maui that needs, you know, that, you know, perceives they need every bit that they can to, you know, remain solvent and such? You know, um, I don't, in the early part when I um, got to ask my question of Sandy Boz this morning, like the businesses over here are really hurting because um, the rent is astronomical, not, not only for the people living here in houses, but the commercial properties. Um, right. And I, I imagine Wailea is the same. And I, I asked him about um, rent relief, you know, because they are, sh a lot of the stores were shuttered from um, the end of March till just recently. And so they're not able to um, use to generate a revenue. And, and, you know, even if we were to say, go back to the old model and say that that's the only answer out of fear or whatever the case is, it wouldn't save them. And so to me, we, we need to um, focus on something different. But um, if they want to persist in that way, then I'm not going to try and stop folks, but I don't see how, how they make either mindset is going to um, bring about economic prosperity in our district. Um, because of the desirability of Lahaina and Wailea and things like that, the, the property values have been become so inflated that it's just not sustainable without that kind of thing. But um, I was um, talking with Lahaina Town Action Committee um, one or two weeks ago, and, and we were trying to brainstorm about how to um, try and, you know, bring back the economic prosperity. And we were looking at things being done in other areas like, um, you know, Berkeley, where um, the restaurants um, were allowed to move out into the streets. And um, a lot of the feedback that I had gotten from actual residents were that, you know, they got, to, when everything was shut down, they got to ride their bikes down front street or skateboard down front street or walk down front street in the middle of the road. And it was an experience like, like 
you know, like you've never experienced before because Front Street is always just crowded with people, crowded with cars. And and we were, um, you know, brainstorming that that could be a thing and where we, um, instead of marketing ourselves to the tourists, we market ourselves to our own residents. We have 150,000 residents. Um, majority have never seen Lahaina like that like how it was in the old days where you just walk down the street and right. you know Lahaina is hot so say we we shut down the road from about like say 3 3 30 till 10 and and do a pilot project and and let the restaurants go out on the street for evening dining and and it's a draw you know maybe we have some some kind of um social distancing shuttles bring people from the other parts of the island why why is it only the mainland um, folks or out of towners that get to experience the the beauty of Lahaina, you know? And and you know maybe we can have different nights because we don't want to have the the big crowds yet. So maybe like you know, open music venue Mondays jazz, Tuesdays Hawaiian music, Thursdays heavy metal. I don't know, you know something like that and just you know what what we need to do is get all the the minds together and just brainstorm on stuff and that's something that um i feel um kind of hamstringed on the council because we're putting these like rules where you, you can't talk to each other out of the council chambers because of the sunshine law, no more than three sunshine law police. And then when you get in the chambers in these committees, you have to have this item that was agendized and went through all the thing. And then even then you can't like just brainstorm or talk with your, your, your partner or your other eight members. You have to be like recognized and like make a motion and all that. And I think that, that's so stifling to to the solutions that we need. Even if we go out into the community and we brainstorm and talk with the businesses, the residents, and like that, you can't have more than three members there. And then and then when you get that, so I think that's that's a major problem. And then the way that you, we're in committees, like yeah, it's great we're in committee one week and then the, we're in an off week and we're supposed to be meeting with all these people, but. A majority of people don't understand how that's how it is and so I'm getting all these calls like when we're in these committee meetings which I kind of feel like is the paying gig side of it like that's the responsibility to show up to these committees and do these actions but I'm getting all these calls like this is going on this is going on and I'm like people feel like that's my job like you gotta be out there fixing all this stuff and doing this and I'm like okay, I, I want to but I, I feel like I have a responsibility to this paying gig to be in this meeting which no windows, boring structure, you know, sunshine law. Yeah. So it's it's a difficult situation. But I think that to me, really, the answer is just getting everybody together and just talking it out and brainstorming and, and um, you know, feedback back and forth and, and trying things out um, and, and seeing where, where we can go. Like, um, add, add some other ideas before, but, you know, I haven't had okay. the means to bring them to fruition okay thank you appreciate and, it and, yeah thank you tomorrow and, and, and again for explaining the way the system works and, and the challenges that are inherent within that system um uh, is alice uh in, in the weight room right now just uh checking in she is okay so uh we've been going tomorrow a little over an hour in our interview right now so uh, again, Great thank time. you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time in your busy schedule. I know that you have more inter more uh, committee meetings that you're doing shortly. So uh, I know that you're full on. But again, I greatly appreciate your taking the time, not only to communicate with us, but as a way of getting this information out to our community also. So thank you very much. Mahalo. Can we have can we have tomorrow just share well, what, 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 maybe. What, just yeah just one one other yep. thing to tomorrow uh, how can people uh, get in touch with uh, you personally learn more about your campaign and also uh, ways that they can support your campaign funding wise uh, if you could just give us some links for that please oh sure um yeah I have a website it's at um, tomorrowpolton.com. I'm still in the process of updating some stuff from last year. I think I, I updated my credentials um, today um, and working on the endorsements. Um, 
I have a Facebook and you can donate off my website or my um, PO box is PO box one, two, two, three, four, Lahaina, Hawaii, nine, six, seven, six, one. Um, and I have a Facebook page, Tamara Paltin for Maui Council. And I just kept that separate from my council member one because, you know, I don't want to campaign on council time. And like sometimes you want to just get out council information to the constituents without it being campaign related. And then I have my personal um, Facebook, um, my Instagram. I think I have um, Tamara for Maui Nui. And, and that's about it. Just, you know. Give a shout out. 